I am uh, deeply honored to be here amongst some very intimidating but some awesome professors and all of you. Um, because of time constraints, I only have 10 minutes and I don't want to take away from Mr. Anand's time. He is an amazing person. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the project, but what I want to really share with you is some of the lessons that I have learned. Um, the GVS Uganda Water Project started in March of 2010. It was started by myself and Annie Hakim, a, a senior here at Grand Valley State University. And we started this project because Annie had gone to Ghana last year through the Service Learning Initiative, and she was scheduled to go to Ghana again this year. And she was going to go for three months of her own accord and just volunteer with her organization. And we happened to meet on spring break, and she said, why don't you come and visit me in Ghana? And I said, OK, I will, but I, I want to do something and not just be a tourist. And so we put our heads together. We did some research, um, you know, uh, looked at some articles, and contacted some friends in Ghana and asked them what some of the issues were that, that were surrounding Winneba, which was a town that we stayed in. And the response that kept on coming back was clean water. There's villages here that need clean water. And although I would love to get into the issues of why there is such a huge, massive need for clean water in Ghana, I can't. Um, but what we did is um, we decided to fundraise and do a clean water initiative. And so we wrote letters to family and friends and professors, some of which you may have received or not. And um, we raised over $7,000 in the course of two months. And then we decided to purchase 30 hydrate biosyn water filters from Cascade Engineering, which is a local company really focused on sustainability. They do a fantastic job. And these water filters are um, engineered to last 10 years, and they work through a natural system of sand and gravel filtration. And so we thought that was the best possible solution to provide for water filtration technology in this village. So we purchased them and we had them shipped to Ghana, which was the most sustainable, unsustainable portion of our project. Um, in August of 2010, the 30 water filters were installed in Atichedo, which is a village outside of Winneba. And by all measures, we could say that this project was a success. There is a clean water team that is run by the villagers. We have a manager on site who goes to the village twice a month. We do bacterial testing once a month to look at the filtration capacity of the filters. And so really, I could, I could kind of you know, chalk this one up and say, this was a success. What's next? But what I want to share with you really is my journey in this process of you know, just being introspective about this process and some of the things that I came across. So I'm going to tell you just a little bit about myself, as you already heard. I am a US Army veteran of six years. And I, now I'm um, a senior, an English major, and a chemistry minor. I know the duality of my right and left brain is something that I enjoy. Um, but I don't have, on paper, really a resume that supports international development work. And that freaked me out when I started this project. This project really started as two you know, idealistic individual people that were saying, let's do this. We weren't really thinking about you know, the consequences or, or anything. And some, you know, I could probably chalk that up to my military hard-headedness. Some would call it brashness, but that's why they give us a helmet in the military. We just kind of duck and go. Um, but you know, there was a lot of fears that were stemming from doing this project. And what I want to share with you is a little video clip. Throughout this process, because it's my first time going to Ghana, I did a little video journal. And this was taken a week before I left for Ghana, and I want to share it with you. If I'm nervous about anything of this project, it's this. It's a, a, an intense responsibility. I don't want to be the person that destroys a way of living, even if it's not that, even if it's a way of living that, that isn't the cleanest or the most hygienic. It's the way that they have been living, and I just don't want it to go away. So those fears were really stemming from the fact that, um, you know, I grew up in India, 
and the India, and I was telling Professor DeWild this, that I, that I grew up in no longer really exists for me. And that's because it's been replaced by Baskin Robbins and Mumbai becoming the New York of India and malls. And that was not something that I wanted to be a participant of. And it, although it seems like a very far-reaching concern, it was still a concern that was very, you know, resided deep within me. And so I did not want to be a participant in providing this, this catalyst, albeit a very small one, to this village. You know, because there are changes that are indelible that I'm not going to be able to see. And this point was really brought home to me when I went up north to Tamale, which is in the northern region of Ghana. And I went to Tamale because in 2008 there was an organization that installed close to 300 water filters. And what I ended up seeing, and, and my intention in, in you know, doing this field research was to see how the villagers were interacting with the filters to really kind of formulate the best installation plan possible for the village that I was working in. Keeping in mind, of course, how different the structures are of the villages based in the north and the south. And what I saw were water filtration systems that had been disposed into huts in this particular village, at least, because there, was no, there were no measures put into place for follow-up training or maintenance training. And what had happened in the northern region of Ghana, the water is so heavily sedimented that it clogs the filters after two years of daily use. But none of the villagers were trained in how to actually maintain these filters. And so the question that I asked myself was, how are we fostering community if this is a legacy that we're leaving behind? And you know, it was this really deep place of anger, but you kind of have to move on and, and figure out a solution. And so the solution that I had to ask myself really was how do I want to foster community in the work that I'm doing? And truth be told, when we started this project, we did not think about the future of this project. We said, we'll install these 30 water filters and they'll last for 10 years and we don't have to do a thing. That, is our, that was our honest approach. And when I saw this in Tamale, I, I really stepped back and said, we need to do something different here. If we are to foster community and if we are to understand that these water filters can change lives and, and save lives, we have to really be doing it from a human perspective. And so this quote by James Baldwin, and it really speaks to Professor Wolverton's idea of to be earth sustainable, you have to be soul sustainable. And I think it really speaks true in this quote that we are all each other. We have male and female, female and male, black and white, and white and black. And as much as I would love to say that I am not a part of Ghana, and it's very easy for me to sterilize myself in this moment and say that I'm not connected to the work I'm doing. I mean, it's a thousand miles away. I think if I can get back to this place and say that we are a part of each other, then this, this work that I do can come from this place that's very deep and very meaningful, but it's also very human. And I think this idea of doing work as social activists or nonprofit activists, we have to have a business sense. But in order to actually foster community as human beings, we have to be human. We have to have a human sense. And I think that's something that we are losing. It's very easy to sterilize ourselves because of the iPods and the iPads and the Kindles and all the other technological advances that we have, but we have to be able to remove ourselves from that. These are not issues that affect us now. Water issues are not something that we are even thinking about here in the United States. We should be thinking about them. But I think if we can step back and say that we are all human beings and we are a part of each other, and that love is what we are, it is what makes us up, it is what we can choose to be, then the work that I do, the work that you do, the work that any other student does or activist does, I think it comes from this really awesome and beautiful place, and it just kind of exponentially grows from there. And so that's an idea that I think I am going to try and harness in my own work, and an idea that I think is worth sharing. Thank you.